We know that God's called us to be an immovable church. So we're going to be studying a unique subject today. We're going to crack open Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. Today is going to be a little different for me. Normally I'll anchor in a story or a particular text. We're going to do a Bible survey a little bit about one subject matter. We'll break open in a minute. My hope is that we'll decipher the entire book of Revelation and all of its prophecies and symbols in the next half an hour. Just kidding there. But you may not have heard a a sermon open up with this passage before, but let's uh, crack into this. Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. It says this, Then the dragon was angry with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her children, those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Here's a picture of my oldest little girl. This is Sienna Rain as Pocahontas just the other day. How adorable is that? And there's Justice photobombing in the back, if you can see that. Grinning in the back, wanting to steal his sister's glory. Well, my, my daughter comes to us a couple weeks ago and says, I had this dream. I had a bad dream, Mom and Dad. And my wife does an amazing job of talking those dreams through, those bad dreams through, because we don't want the enemy to have fear take place in their life or their heart. We want to be able to speak the truth of God in the midst of the enemy's life that he brings. So we said, well, what happened in the dream? She said, we were outside and these dragons were flying around our house. And instantly my wife is just quickened and says, I think there's something behind this. And she says, Sina Rain, I want you to think for a minute. Talk me through this dream. She said, okay. So she sits down, shares the dream with Rachel. After she shares the dream, she says, you got to bring dad in to hear this. So I come in and this is the dream. She says, we were outside and there's all these dragons flying throughout our neighborhood and over our house. And daddy and a, th- a few of his friends were outside. And mommy, you said to all of us kids that we had to come inside. And mommy, we obeyed first time and went right inside. It's a good thing. Thank you, Lord, for obedience and dreams, right? So she was all excited that they obeyed the first time when we went right inside. Well, we were outside, she said, me and a few of my friends, and we all had swords in our hand. And as we have these swords, we're about to fight these dragons, but we had to stand in the road and we weren't supposed to move in the road. And right when the dragons were about to attack us, God and all of his angels, Jesus and his angels came to fight these dragons. And as they're fighting these dragons, this giant dragon lands on our house and is trying to crush our house. But Jesus goes up to the dragon and says, get off their house. These are my people and you have no power over them. It's a pretty cool dream. He then slays the dragon and all these dragons flee. And daddy and his friends come inside the house with Jesus and mommy, they won. They won the battle, mommy. And they come inside and we sit down with Jesus and have a party and eat cake and ice cream. I love that ending. Whether it's true or not, it's amazing. I, how many are down for a birthday party with Jesus, right? A little cake and ice cream party with Jesus. But we talked and we walked through that dream. We just thought, man, what an amazing picture. Here's the beauty of this. We were standing in the street and we weren't the ones that won the battle. Jesus was the one that won the battle. He was the one that defeated these swirling dragons. In Revelation 12, we have all this imagery that John uses, but we have to understand this. It speaks of a war that we are in. The dragon, the enemy, is making war against your family. He's making war against your spiritual journey. He's making war against your friendships. He is angry because he knows his time is short. And he's trying to see this church, the body of Christ, move back or shrink back. But God's called us to be an immovable church. And Paul writes about this, how Jesus overcame death, how he disarmed the spiritual authorities in the heavenly places. He says this in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 57. He says, the sting of death has been taken away, but thanks be to God who gives the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have victory through Jesus, verse 38. Therefore, my beloved, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the work of the Lord, because you know that in the Lord, your labor is not in vain. We can stand fast and not move, not because of our own strength, not because of our own capability, not because of our own gifting, but because Christ has the victory. That's the foundation that we can stand on. And he wants us to be a fearless, immovable church. But the enemy is doing his best to create an illusion that we're not going to win. He wants to create an illusion that you're not going to make it, 
that you're gonna give up, that God's gonna let you down. And it says in 1 Peter 5, 8, another image of the enemy is that he's this lion that is prowling around looking for who he can devour. That he's looking for weakness. He's looking for that area in which he can seize and attack. Now, ever since the age of Lion King, for some reason, lions have become cute in our culture. Here's a cute lion right here, right? Exactly. That's the problem. Lions are not cute. Lions are fierce. They're dangerous and they're terrifying. We have to understand that the enemy is not this cute entity, that it's really not that bad. Oh, no, it's a whole lot of bad. He's trying to intimidate and devour your family. But God has called us to be an immovable church. Now, one of the key characteristics of the early church was their boldness. They were never afraid. No matter what the threat at hand was, they were not shrinking back, but they stood firm. And the enemy thought he could disband the church if he persecuted them. If he brought the pressure on, maybe they'll stop declaring the name of Jesus. But there's a problem that takes place. The moment that persecution starts to come in play, what happens? The church starts to expand and multiply. The church starts to grow and grow and grow. How do we become a church that's an immovable church? How do we become a church that's a fearless church? How do we become a church that's a bold church? I think it starts with us looking back at some of the key characteristics of the early church. And in Acts chapter 9, right after this massive persecution, Luke gives us this brief insight of some of the key components of the early church. Acts chapter 9, verse 31 says this, Meanwhile, the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and was built up, living in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. It increased in numbers. So we see this expansion, this multiplication taking place. And Luke describes four characteristics of the early church. Number one, they had peace. How many want peace in their life? They were growing now, not just numerically, it speaks of a spiritual maturity taking place. As you learn throughout the Bible, they were growing in love. This was happening. And the last one he mentions is they have the comfort of the Holy Spirit. They are comforted by the Holy Spirit. Now, in modern church, we really enjoy messages about peace. We really enjoy messages about spiritual growth. We really enjoy messages about comfort, but we often don't hear messages about the fear of the Lord. It's something that we really don't know what to do with. In my Christian journey, I've maybe heard one or two messages about the fear of the Lord. Because in the New Testament context, fear is a negative thing. We're not called to live in fear or anxiety or worry, but still we can't get away of this passage or this verse that's throughout scripture. We see the fear of the Lord mentioned several times throughout the Old and New Testament. It's this concept that is reoccurring. And really what I believe is one of the key characteristics of becoming an immovable church is we have to rediscover the fear of the Lord again. We have to be a church that's not just really excited about peace and growth and comfort. If we're called to be an immovable people that is not intimidated by the enemy's threats, we have to understand the fear of the Lord again. And the Old Testament did a brilliant job that created a foundation of what it meant to truly be an immovable people of God. And one of those key foundation points were the fear of the Lord. Now, when you study the fear of the Lord, we learn that there's all these amazing blessings that come from it. Throughout Psalms and Proverbs and the Old Testament prophets, it says the fear of the Lord leads to wealth and riches. It's the beginning of wisdom, protection, provision, promises of long life, a refuge for your family, a fountain of life. It then produces even more wealth and riches. How many want some of those things, right? This is like Prosperity Gospel 101. Then why isn't it the anchor of so many things we talk about? Because when we look at that word fear, we've kind of dumbed it down to mean reverence or respect only. When you often hear about the fear of the Lord, it's reverence or respect. But there's a problem with that word fear. It means terror, terrifying, awe, dread. The fear of the Lord means to be afraid of God. That's the long and the short of it. And we've shied away from it, but we've missed the context of it. 
When we isolate fear alone, it's out of context. The key part of this concept is the fear of the Lord. It's about his lordship. It's about him being the ruling entity in your life. Romans 10, 9. We've all heard this before. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. When you've walked through Romans Road or you've been introduced to what it means to give your life to Jesus, we say this, but what happens is we get hung up not on his lordship, but that word belief. There's a problem with that word belief. Belief in God is not equal to salvation with God. There's these things called the demons, James says. They too believe in God, but we all know where they're going. See, we've settled for beliefism in our culture, and we know that God's our father and friend, but he's not called to be familiar. We become overly familiar with God, and because we've settled with beliefism and forgot his lordship, we have these ideas like Jesus is our homeboy. You ever heard this before? Or Jesus is like this thumbs up character. Jesus and I are tight. We get this idea that God is our co-pilot. But when God is our co-pilot, this is often what happens or is the result of what takes place. When God's in the passenger seat, your life will just end like a train wreck. He doesn't want to just be in the passenger seat of your life. He wants the wheel. He wants to be the one directing you and leading you and guiding you. This is the concept of lordship. In the early church, they understood it because who was Lord? Caesar was. And you had to give allegiance to Caesar. And by saying that Caesar was Lord, he was now the ruling entity and he owned your property. He owned what you had. But when the Christians came on the scene and Jesus' resurrection took place, they began to declare that Jesus was Lord. And for us to understand his lordship, we have to know what it means to fear him again. We have to know what it means that he becomes not second or third or a casual person that gives a suggestion. It means that Jesus needs to be first in every area of your life. Jesus needs to be number one. So what I want to do this morning is we're going to unpack the fear of the Lord. We're going to unpack what it means that he's our father. He's our friend. We love the Lord. We're not to be afraid of him in the context of not drawing near to him, but he needs to be first in every area of our life. And we're going to do a brief survey throughout the Old New Testament real quick of three key areas that will help us understand what the fear of the Lord is. How do we make God first again and put him in his rightful position so that he doesn't become overly familiar? And where we start that journey is all the way in the beginning of the book, Genesis 1. Verse 1. Let's read that together. It says this In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, Moses would talk about this time when kings would come in or Israel would like a king. He said, In order to learn the fear of the Lord, you have to read the law of God. I want you to place the law of God in every king's hands so they would know what it means to fear the Lord. This is in Deuteronomy 17. And when they would open up the law, guess where they would start? They would start right here in verse 1 of Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In order for us to understand the fear of the Lord, we have to understand that God is creator. Now, a lot of us know that God is creator here, but we've lost sight that God is creator here. We have to not just know it intellectually, we have to know it from our heart, that God is in charge of all of this. The very foundation, dirt I stand on, the buildings I'm in, he's the one that manufactured and made everything around me that now man's buildings have been made up of. And the early church and the Old Testament, the Israel knew this very well. In Psalms 33, it says this, by the word of the Lord, what? The heavens were made, the starry host by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea into jars. He puts the deep into storehouses. It speaks of the greatness of God. It speaks that God's so massive, so big, that those oceans you see, he could place them in little jars on a countertop. He can take all that you see, and he's so massive and so great and so grand that all of the people should fear and revere the Lord, the psalmist writes. See, there's something about nature that produces a natural fear in all of us. How many have ever walked through the forest late at night? You're a little scared. 
Why? Because you know there are things out there that are more powerful than you. There are things out there in your vulnerable state that you will not be able to maybe fend for yourselves. How many have ever been in the ocean before and overwhelmed by the ocean's waves? You know that there's a greater entity out there that is bigger than you are. You're in a vulnerable state. There's an appropriate fear that takes place. Several years ago, my uh, brother and I went on a vacation. It was the big epic family vacation to Hawaii, and we were destined to snorkel. We wanted to see the amazing ocean life of around Hawaii. So we get this book on snorkeling and we're going to find all these hot snorkel spots. And we found about this place called Turtle Cove. So we, we hiked to this, this little beach and here's Turtle Cove. And when we get there, the water is really murky. And this is unusual because, again, the, all the travel guides said how clear the water was here. So we start getting in the water and we're snorkeling around and there's no turtles. There's nothing there. We, our visibility is very low, and we start continuing to swim out and swim out and swim out, and we see nothing. And the water is really cold, which is, again, very odd for Hawaii. And as we're out there, we're really far away from, from the shoreline. As we look out, all of a sudden, this fear grips us, and we don't feel safe. It doesn't feel right. I look to my brother. We're in our 20s. I say, are you scared? He says, Yeah. I said, should we swim back? He's like, yeah. So we start swimming back, but the water's so murky and the way the, the tide is rolling, we start drifting out further. And we look at each other. I say, brother, the only way we'll be able to swim back is if we hold hands. <laughs> so in humility, I reach out to my brother and we lock hands. And we're like, don't tell anybody about this. <laughs> And we start swimming back and barreling in and swimming back, holding hands. These grown men scared of the waters we're swimming in. We finally arrive back to the shore and we're like, what a terrible tourist spot. We find some locals and they're like, you were swimming in Turtle Cove? We're like, yeah, we were out there. We found out about it. They're like, there was a storm the other day and a cold waterfront came in and it brought in all these great white sharks. They ate all the turtles. We were not alone. There was an appropriate fear that took place in that moment of humility as I reached out to grab my brother's hand. The power of nature when we're out there is we realize there's something bigger than ourselves. It's time for us to learn how small we are sometimes. It's time for us to understand that God, all that is around here that I don't have control of, you have control of. And it brings an appropriate fear and honor to the Lord. Romans chapter 1, verse 20, speaks of this. Paul writes, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. Creation is the ultimate witnessing tool. Creation is the very first evangelism program. Is called to reveal God's greatness and his power, his divine attributes, his qualities. By walking around, we understand God's a benevolent God, that he's provided water and food and seasons for our life. And from this, it makes us wonder, wow, there must be something greater than me out there. It's the ultimate witnessing tool. But for many of us, we live so much in what man has manufactured, we lose sight of it. Think about your commute. Think about your life. How often we're sheltered in the things that man has made. In 1994, there was this earthquake that caused this massive blackout in LA. And there started to be all these 911 calls at night. And the calls were unexpected. All these people started calling and saying, I'm really scared. I'm really concerned. There are these glowing clouds in the sky. What are these glowing clouds? What's happening? Is the sky on fire? And an artist gave a rendition. What they were seeing for the first time was the stars over LA. They had never seen the stars before. There's this thing called light pollution. And light pollution actually blinds you from the beauty of the creation above. What things have polluted your life that have blinded us from seeing the beauty of what God's doing around you? 
There's something powerful about his creative power in our life, but we have to give him the ability to reveal it to us. And in order to understand the fear of the Lord, we have to understand that God is creator. He's made all these things. The second aspect is this. We have to understand that God is judge. He is the ultimate judge. The Supreme Court does not have more power than the Lord does. He is the one that has been elected above all because he's the one that made all of these things. And here is the true reality. We will all stand before him in judgment. Something we kind of hear about, but we have to be confronted with. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, for we must all appear before what? The judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Since then we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade others. The judgment seat of Christ produces the fear of the Lord. And from this place, we want to tell others, listen, you will stand before him and give an account. Paul continues with this, and actually in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he says, if anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, or costly stone, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring to light. The day will bring it to light. That's talking about the judgment. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder receives a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though as one only escaping through the flames. This verse is not talking about believers and unbelievers. It's talking about the believer's work being tested for what they've built. We'll all be held accountable even those that have given their life to Jesus, what you build will be tested for the age to come. God's fire will reveal everything in your life. This produces appropriate fear. See, when we stand before the Lord, he's not gonna say, man, that's an amazing car collection you have. Wow, I can't believe how many hours of Netflix binge watching you actually pulled off. You did all that in a weekend? Bravo. See, those are the things that will not stand before the fire of the Lord. The well, only things that will matter is how you loved him and loved your family and loved those around you. Did you love others and present and represent him well? Did you tell others of his love and reveal it? Those are the only things that are really going to stand. Your awesome house, your great cars, your whatever It's not going to stand before the Lord. It's how you worshiped him in this life that will count for the age to come. There's a very real reward system here. God will give us stewardships in the future kingdom that he brings about on earth. That's a real reality. We have to understand that we'll stand before his judgment. And we have to know that God sees everything. Turn to the person next to you and say, he's watching you. He sees everything. Hebrews 4 says this, nothing is hidden in all of creation from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before his eyes of him whom we must give an account. Again, we'll stand before his judgment. He sees everything. What if we actually sat down to watch things and thought, huh, would Jesus want to watch this with me? Because he is. Would this be something I'd be comfortable with Jesus doing with me? He sees it all. Sometimes we're like children that think we can hide things from our parents. How many have ever had their kids try to hide something from you that was actually comedic or comical? I remember one morning, my wife and I slept in till seven. It was a glorious day. And we slept in and we woke up refreshed and we're like, wow, what time is it? What's happened? Seven o'clock. And then that terror hits you. It's too quiet. Where's my, where's my son? So I, I quickly sprint out of bed, and I find my son in the restroom as there's this giant trail of human waste all the way down the carpet. I'm like, of course it's quiet. 
So I don't want to wake up my wife and I hear her yelling, Brandon, Brandon. I'm like, just give me a minute. I bring out this washcloth, this bucket. I'm scrubbing the carpet. I'm like, okay, she does not want to wake up to this. And finally she continues. I'm like, just a minute, just a minute. She's like, you got to come here. She says, what's all this toilet paper? I said, what toilet paper? What is all this toilet paper? And we walk into our bathroom area that was carpeted. There are 12 rolls of toilet paper all placed, and every spot my son has placed a roll of toilet paper on, hoping we would not discover it. And you look at that, I'm like, hey, you can't fault the kid for trying. But we walked away from that thing, we said, how much is this like our life with God? We try to cover up our mess, hoping that no one will see, but when we really look at it, it's quite comedic. No matter how hard we try, these things that we think we can get over on God with, he knows when you place organic bananas in a conventional fruit bag when you go to the grocer. He's the one that sees that. You may get over the grocery counter checkout line person, but he sees all those things. What if we lived in the fear of the Lord? Say, Lord, it doesn't matter who I can get one over on or what thing I can really work around or cheat someone out of. I want to honor you. I want to live in the appropriate fear of the Lord, knowing that I will give an account. And one thing we really have to watch in our culture, my generation in particular, is we will be held accountable for what we say. Matthew 12, Jesus says very clearly, I tell you, everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. You want to know what revival looks like? It looks like actually watching over the things we say. Revival and awakening will happen when we start to realize we'll be held accountable for the words we say. That really, when Jesus says, make sure we speak uplifting words, words of love, seasoned with grace and light, he actually meant it. And it's not just the words we speak, it's also the things we type on Facebook and Twitter and all the social media things, we'll be held accountable for those realities. What if we utilized our social outlets for building others up rather than tearing others down? What would that do? What if you actually used your whatever social service or your text messaging to think, how many can I encourage today rather than how many can I talk ill of today? Let's utilize our power of communication to bring about the life of God rather than just really mounting up things that we'll be held accountable for. We have to understand that God is our judge. The last element today we want to talk about in understanding the fear of the Lord, we have to understand that God is love. And we often think, how does God being love coincide with the fear of the Lord? See, one of the key verses in the New Testament, 1 John 4, is a beautiful verse. It says this, 1 John 4, verse 16. And so we know now and rely on the love that God has for us, for God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. Verse 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We think, how can the fear of God coincide with the love of God? What John is talking about here is that we know through God's love that he's extended to us through the life of Jesus, through the cross of Jesus, the forgiveness he offers. We don't have to be afraid of God and not approach him or talk to him. We don't have to live like the pagans where they're in terror of their gods, but it wasn't to disregard the appropriate reverence and respect and fear that we're supposed to have towards the Lord. It wasn't disregarding that. And what we've done is we've made verses like this an idol in our culture. What we've done is we know that God is love, but instead we've made love a God. Love is actually a God we worship in our culture. And we made the love of God a cultural love that we subscribe to. And by doing so, we've made this image of God that is less powerful, less sovereign, the God of great suggestions. And in return, we've made God in our image and likeness. We've made a God that we're comfortable with. A God that says, hey, you know what? You can pick that up tomorrow. It was just, I I don't don't want to tread on your, your feelings. I don't want to hurt your feelings. That's not the God we find in the New Testament. He's a God that's powerful, 
It produces awe. And what we learn is that God reveals his love also through his discipline. Hebrews says this very clearly. God disciplines those he loves. He reveals his love through his correction. He's not the parent that is yelling at their kids, counting to three, hoping that they'll come back. One, I said one, two. No. God is so kind that he disciplines us that when he gives us directions, he says, don't touch that, he'll let you touch the hot stove to realize how hot it is. He's kind in establishing boundaries. He's a holy God. We have to understand that God is love, but it doesn't negate that he's powerful and really deserves appropriate respect and fear. We have to learn to fear the Lord with the love of God intact. And we learn this as well, that the love of God, the kindness of God, leads us to repentance. When God reveals his love, he often does it through his power. And we see time and time again throughout the story of Jesus that people get healed, and when they're healed, their life changes. He reveals his love through a healing. And I, I don't really see too many entitled healings in the Gospels. People aren't like, Jesus healed him. like, it's about time, God. Yeah, thanks for healing my blindness, but I'm good now. No, there's this transformation that takes place. When God reveals his love, what do you see? A worshipful response takes place. They know that through the revelation of his love, they fear God appropriately, knowing that they don't deserve his love, but God has given it to them and he's kind enough to do so. There's a transformation that takes place. God's love actually leads us to fear him appropriately. Several years ago, we had this student that would just bring friends from school all the time to our youth ministry. And as he would bring them out and all these people that didn't know Jesus, one day I, would, I picked him up from his, his uh, house and he had brought a friend with him. As he brings his friend, it was a normal youth group night, but at the end there was this unique move of the Spirit that happened where there was an unusual grace for healing. Now, there's always a grace for healing, but there's those days that happen where the power of the Lord is so present, you know miracles are going to break out. And we're there, and I get this word. I feel like someone has a hearing loss, and God wants to restore their healing. God's going to restore their healing. So I just say, is there anybody here with a hearing loss that you would like prayer for? Well, the kid that we brought raised his hand. So I go over to him, and we pray, and God opens up his ear and restores his healing. Amazing things take place. In that moment, he breaks out in tears, gives his life to Jesus. So we start talking, his friend that brought him said, man, this guy's an atheist, he doesn't believe in God, this is unreal. And we drive him home. I'm so excited to see what's going to take place. Well, next week, I pick up uh, the, the kid from his house to, uh, to bring him. I'm like, hey, where's your friend? He's like, man, he, he wasn't answering my calls today. I'm like, man, that's, that's weird. Next week happens, hey, where's your friend? He, he's, he's avoiding me. He's not going near me. I'm like, you have to find out what's happening. I mean, there was such a significant move in his life a couple weeks ago. What happened? Then finally, I get the report back. You know, that night when he went home, he realized that his life would have to change. And he asked God to take away his healing. And it, and it happened. His hearing left. And that'll tweak with your theology big time. And we walked away. I just could not believe it. But as I processed that, it shows the power of the love of God. It shows the power that the love of God produces you to change. And it brought that young man to a place where he said, I'm not willing to give up what I love. I'm not willing to give these things up. The love of God reveals the fear of the Lord. We have to understand, I will submit to him. I will give my life to him. I met that kid several years later. He actually gave his life to Jesus again. Powerful testimony. I'm not sure what happened in regards to the miracle or the healing, but there was a movement that took place where he had to come to terms. Am I truly going to give everything to Jesus? And his love reveals that last verse here, Revelation chapter one. We started out with Revelation 12 that spoke of the dragon that comes to intimidate us. But the foundation of the book of Revelation that John writes, where God is revealing his plan, he's encountered by the resurrected Jesus. In chapter one, verse 17, it says this, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. 
He sees Jesus in his glorified state and what happens? He's impacted by the power and the reverence and the glory of Jesus. But here's the intriguing word. Jesus says to him, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, the living one. I was dead and see I'm alive forever and I have the keys of death and Hades. Here's this appropriate balance of the fear of the Lord where John drops in reverence, understanding the significance of God. But even in the fear of the Lord, Jesus invites him into relationship and says, don't have inappropriate fear. Don't be afraid. I'm your friend. I love you. I'm your God. I'm your king. But here's the important portion. I am the first and I'm the last. The key concept of understanding today is what area does Jesus need to be first in your life again? What place in your life does Jesus need to be first in again? Is it your own spiritual walk? Is it your family? Is it your finances? Is it your workplace? Understanding the fear of the Lord is understanding that God is creator, that he's made all this, that God is judge, that he'll hold us accountable, that God is love. His love reveals his power that brings us an appropriate fear of him, which leads us to the ultimate point. If we fear the Lord, it means we're making God first in every area. Is Jesus truly Lord of everything? Have you handed over the deed of your land called your life and said, God, I make you first?